Welcome back to Blog Life Television. On the 19th of July, I gave a presentation at Dundee Museum of Transport called Electric Vehicles, You Wish You'd Bought One Sooner. Now, there was a lot of interest in this event, but not everyone could make it, so there was a lot of requests to upload it to YouTube afterwards. The bad news is that the recording didn't quite work out. The good news is, however, because you asked so nicely, I've sat down and recorded it again. So with no further ado, here is my presentation. Thank you very much for joining us for my presentation, Electric Vehicles, You'll Wish You'd Bought One Sooner. Today I'm going to be telling you all about how I got into electric vehicles in the first place, their history, the advantages of owning an EV, the practicalities, the economics. I'll be doing a fair bit of myth busting as well to prove to you that electric vehicles already are the best vehicles for just about anyone and actually have been for a few years now. So first up, a little bit of background, a bit about me. I am Dr Ewan McTurk and I am an electric vehicle battery engineer and electrochemist. I have plenty of experience in taking Tesla cells apart and sticking probes in them and figuring out just how they behave, how hard we can push them, how they fail and how we can stop them failing. And that was my previous job at WMG, University of Warwick. Before that I was doing similar stuff at the University of Oxford where I completed my DPhil or PhD in material science. That's where I also worked on next generation cell chemistries such as lithium air, which is a breathing battery that actually has more in common with a fuel cell than a lithium ion cell. I'm now an electrochemist working at Ducosi, which as many of you who are familiar with Plug Life Television know, is a company that has developed a wireless battery management system. But my electric vehicle story started back at the University of Dundee, where as an undergraduate student doing renewable energy, which was an applied physics degree, I was entering my fourth year and I was looking for an honours project to do, when one fateful day in 2009, the person who would become my project supervisor turned up in this a 1999 Peugeot 106 electric. This would turn out to be not only the first electric car I've ever driven, but the car that launched my career. So let's have a look at the background on these machines. They were originally brought in by Peugeot and Citroen between 1995 and 2005, when PSA Peugeot Citroen produced about 10,000 electric vehicles running on NICAD nickel cadmium batteries one of only about 20 left in the UK on the road when I first got behind the wheel of it. There are now only about eight left on the road. They are exceptionally rare machines in the UK. Tech spec wise, it was hardly going to be a record breaker really. It's only a 20 kilowatt DC motor. That's about 27 horsepower. But that said, it did have 127 newton meters of torque, which means that when it came to putting that power down, it could do it very effectively. And in fact, that vehicle did actually scalp a Ferrari off the line once. However, we then did go round a corner and up a steep hill and a normal natural balance was restored. The battery pack, as I said, was NICAD. Only 12 kilowatt hours. NICAD doesn't have a particularly high energy density, especially in comparison to the likes of the Tesla nickel cobalt aluminium cells that they're using at the moment. So 12 kilowatt hours is about half of the original Nissan Leafs battery pack. That gives you an idea of how far behind the technology was at the time. It had a range of 50 miles per charge, not to 60, yes, if there was a tailwind. And the charging socket predates any modern charging infrastructure, so it was something that looks very different in comparison to anything that you'll have on an EV today. It was a Marshall charger, that paddle, which then locks into the vehicle. Extra moving components versus the Type 2 socket that has become commonplace today, they did get a bit brittle towards the end of their lifespan. And on the other end of that, was a 13 amp plug. So it took about six hours to recharge off the mains. However, its redeeming feature was that interior. That is original. That was a standard Peugeot fit to many of these vehicles. Tartan seats, I absolutely love it. So this particular vehicle has had something of an illustrious history. Initially, it was used by me in my honors and masters project on next generation batteries. So I characterised this vehicle in its original trim to see just how much we could improve its performance whilst I was doing background work on lithium air. It featured in several news articles and at a conference within the University of Dundee, the Dundee Sustainability Student Showcase and Conference. We somehow managed to squeeze that into one of the buildings in, in Dundee for the exhibition. It was also taken for a spin by the then First Minister of Scotland, Alex Salmond, when he arrived at campus in 2011 to launch a new energy and transport strategy. 
Now, I drove that particular car around in the middle of winter for two weeks with a dead battery in it. Now, this was a particularly cold winter. I think it was 2010. The auxiliary battery, the lead acid battery, which you can find in any vehicle, petrol, diesel, hybrid or electric, the one that powers the headlights, the radio, etc. I found out that that was dead when the remote central locking didn't work. So I thought, oh God, what's going to happen here? Am I going to be stranded? Certainly with the petrol car, you would be because you wouldn't be able to use the starter motor. However, when I put the keys in the, well, it's not really ignition now, is it? But when I put the keys in and switched the car on, the DC to DC converter allowed the higher voltage traction battery to compensate for the lack of auxiliary battery. So it was able to, to downgrade to 12 volts and power all of the systems. And as I said, I couldn't be bothered replacing the battery for a fortnight until it got slightly warmer. This vehicle also survived the great fuel crisis of 2012 very neatly. So when everyone was queuing up for the petrol pumps, I was able to keep on going to where I needed to go. I had absolutely no impact because of the great fuel crisis whatsoever. And in the process, that car became the subject of my first ever internet meme. Looking very smug there. Later on, it was upgraded to lithium-ion batteries with digital dashboard and a modern charge point compatibility. Here you can see in the background it's plugged in to a conventional Type 2 charge point in Kilmarnock next to a, an Outlander plug-in hybrid. So in its latter days, it was able to do about 70 miles per charge. I was regularly doing 30 mile round trips every day for about a pound's worth of ecotricity. And this was when ecotricity wasn't cheaper than your regional supplier. This was when renewable energy was still a luxury rather than actually one of the cheapest forms, in fact, the cheapest form of energy on the market today. That vehicle is now on display at Dundee Museum of Transport, where I did this talk. However, that is not the oldest electric vehicle in existence, definitely not by any stretch of the imagination. So let's have a very brief look at the history of electric vehicles. Uh, now, in terms of rechargeable batteries, because electric vehicles had actually been around since the middle of the, the 19th century, the middle of the 1800s, with disposable single-use primary batteries. But towards the turn of the 20th century, electric vehicles actually had about a 33% market share, not least because they were safe, that you didn't have to risk breaking your arm using a crank handle for a petrol car. They were quick to boot up, so unlike steam-powered cars, they were instantly ready to go. Also, bear in mind that the speeds on roads, because roads weren't in very good condition back then, the speeds were lower, therefore you needed less power. And therefore, even lead-acid batteries could get some electric vehicles to do about 100 miles per charge. So one particularly successful example was the electric taxi in New York. There was a company that ran a fleet of electric taxis that had lead-acid batteries that were swapped, much like Better Place and Tesla experimented with 100 years later. Moving on a couple of years, there was the Jamais Content, which actually held the world land speed record at a whopping 100 kilometres per hour. Moving on about a decade, the Detroit Electric was a very popular town car. In fact, Henry Ford's wife had one rather than a Model T. She preferred the ease, the quietness and the comfort of an electric car. Detroit Electric was still using lead-acid batteries, but they did experiment with nickel-iron batteries, partly created by Thomas Edison. Now, that particular example there is Jay Leno's electric car. It's his Detroit Electric. And that one is still using its original set of nickel iron batteries. The lifespan of these is phenomenal if you maintain them properly. So why are we not using them today? Well, they have an incredibly high rate of self-discharge. In other words, if you've not got it plugged in and you're not driving the vehicle, it's literally doing nothing. It will actually deplete its capacity quite substantially. Its efficiency is very low, but that said, its energy density was a lot better than lead acid, although it did come at a considerable price premium. Not too much advances happened within electric vehicles and battery tech. Round about the 1960s, Scottish Aviation at Presswick experimented with electric vehicles, again using lead-acid batteries. They created the Scamp, which was meant to be an urban vehicle that would do about 40 miles range, uh, about 40 miles top speed. Unfortunately, the build quality let it down and its, its project was curtailed quite early on. However, the creators of the Scamp were looking to the future. They were looking into zinc air batteries, breathing batteries, not too dissimilar to the lithium air, which I worked on during the first half of my PhD. Unfortunately, a good half a century on, the only commercially available zinc air batteries that you can get today are single-use ones in hearing aids. Another decade and another town car, the Enfield 8000, still using lead-acid batteries, 
roughly the same performance but of a much better build quality, it's most well known because Johnny Smith of fully charged fame converted one to the Flux Capacitor, the world's fastest street legal all electric drag racer. It was the 1990s that battery tech really started to pick up, and the BMW E1 and Ford EcoStar both featured molten salt batteries. These run at very high temperatures, 350 degrees C, but they also have excellent energy density in comparison to lead acid, with about a fourfold increase. This allowed a genuine 100 mile range at motorway speeds. Unfortunately, the particular molten salt chemistry that was used by these early vehicles was particularly corrosive, and as a result, there were battery fires in the Ford EcoStar, which curtailed the development programme. Later, there were improvements in cell chemistry for molten salt batteries, which resolved this issue. Unfortunately, by that point, interest in that had largely waned, although the Modec delivery vans of the mid-2000s did have molten salt batteries as an option. One of the downsides, even of the safer type of molten salt battery, is that if you leave the car unplugged and you're not using it, that molten salt suddenly crystallises, it's no longer molten, and it takes a lot of effort and energy to remelt it to get it as a functional battery again. A few years later, GM released the EV1, and the Toyota RAV4 EV also came onto the scene about a year later. Both of these cars used nickel metal hydride batteries, which again had about a fourfold increase in energy density over lead acid, so again, genuine 100 mile ranges at motorway speeds. The RAV4 EV is arguably the best electric vehicle ever made when you consider the technology that was available at the time. Lithium-ion batteries had been officially launched on the market by Sony in 1992, but were still nowhere near ready to insert into electric vehicles. They were only ready for consumer electronics. As a result, nickel metal hydride was definitely the way to go. Unfortunately, Chevron bought the patent for these nickel metal hydride cells and basically tried to sue Panasonic if they produced any that were large enough to go into a fully electric vehicle rather than just a hybrid. That one selfish act delayed EV uptake by about a decade. We should all have been driving RAV4 EVs as early as 2000 and onwards. However, my 106 has since been upgraded to something a bit more contemporary. And here it is, my 24 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf called Busby, as it looks on as my 106 is delivered to Dundee Museum of Transport. So let's see how far the technology's come on in a reasonably short space of time. We have a quadrupling of motor power afforded by doubling of battery capacity, which means that you can obtain a real world range in the leaf of 90 miles at fairly comfortable speeds. Not to 60 is actually achievable this time because you can do motorway speeds and then some in the leaf. The charging sockets, now interestingly, by this point, the 106 electric had been upgraded to a lithium iron phosphate pack, which is a fairly docile form of lithium iron battery. There was a 50% increase in the pack capacity in the process, 20 mile increase in range, 100 kilogram lighter battery as well. And I upgraded it so that it was compatible with modern charging infrastructure. I gave it a type two socket, which is what you have on the likes of a Renault Zoe. The Leaf of course has the type one and the Charimo. Recharging times, well, of course the Leaf can rapid charge in half an hour using a Charimo, but with the original onboard charger in the 106, it was an eight hour recharging time, still using a very low power charger. But interestingly, look at the costs, both of them showing as 8,000 pounds here, the Leaf being second hand, of course, but that price for the 106 electric is just for the battery upgrade alone. So within the space of only a handful of years, we've seen that batteries have improved so much and the costs has fallen considerably. So what are the advantages of a Leaf versus an internal combustion engine car or ICE? Well, there's instant torque, so there's rapid acceleration off the line. It will genuinely beat a Nissan 350Z, I'm reliably informed, off the line. And also, there are no issues whatsoever with hill climbing. It absolutely relishes it. Regenerative braking, I rarely need to use the foot brake, because as soon as I take my foot off the throttle, I just end up with the motor working effectively in reverse principles, and it gathers the kinetic energy and stuffs it back into the battery as electricity. So you can basically do one foot driving as well. Perfect for rush hour. You're not constantly juggling between the throttle and the brake pedal. You're using that regenerative braking to have nice smooth one foot driving. There's also instant heating. There's no waiting for a petrol engine to warm up because you've got resistive heaters and heat pumps which kick into action instantly. And there's also vastly improved reliability. EVs are virtually indestructible. There's very few moving components on them and they will last hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of miles mechanically. But one of the best advantages is definitely the smartphone app for the preheat function. This also works for cooling in the summer, but 
As for preheat, in the middle of winter when everyone else is defrosting their windscreens by scraping them, I can basically wake up in the morning, have a look at my smartphone, press a couple of buttons, turn the climate control on, and that will preheat the car for me whilst it's still plugged into the mains, therefore it's not using any of its battery to do so, and I have a nice toasty defrosted car by the time I'm ready to go to work. So expectations versus reality. The Leaf was bought as a direct replacement for my 106, which was really only suited to shorter journeys, or at least within a single charge worth of range per day, otherwise it would take a long time to recharge. I was going to use that in tandem with my 2001 Mark I Honda Insight Hybrid, which is another fairly rare beast, but it's an incredibly efficient machine and quite reliable. So the expectation was my Leaf would be used about 50% of the time. It would do my 50 mile round trip commute and other short journeys, whilst the Insight would do cross country trips from Edinburgh to Glasgow, Dundee, Ayrshire and trips down south. However, reliability of the Leaf combined with the reliability and availability of rapid charging infrastructure means that the Leaf does the vast majority of my journeys. So it actually does all journeys throughout Scotland now. We've got more than enough charging infrastructure to cope with that. I could potentially do cross country treks as well. I use the Insight for trips down south basically to stop it seizing up. In terms of charging my Leaf, it's really simple. There are numerous options available. At home, I have this wall box that's been fitted. It's an E-Volt wall box, the same company who has installed the vast majority of the charging infrastructure in Scotland. That was funded by two different grants. So there's the Office for Low Emission Vehicles, OLEV, that give you up to £500 or 75% of the cost of the installation. And in Scotland, the Energy Saving Trust grant gives you up to £300 towards the cost of your charge point. Realistically these days, unless your house's main fuse box is a considerable distance from your driveway or your garage, you should, in Scotland, be getting a charge point installed for free. I've gone for a socketed home charger, so one that I plug the public charging cable into that I've got in the back of the car. That's future-proof because it's a Type 1 socket on the Leaf, but it's a Type 2 socket, for example, on the i3, on the Zoe, on the Ionic. So if I upgraded to one of those cars in the future, or if someone came to visit me who had one of those cars, and I had a tethered Type 1 plug on a lead, they would not be able to plug in. So I strongly recommend going for a socketed charge point. My car typically recharges from 0 to 100% in 4 hours. I've got the optional 6.6 kilowatt onboard charger, which does make a big difference when you're destination charging. Now, there are a number of smart units coming onto the market for charging. The best one by far is the Zappi. Now, this allows you to maximise the amount of renewable energy that you use, especially if you have home renewables like solar power. So, it calculates how much your solar panels are producing, it calculates how much energy your house is using, and it pumps the difference into your electric car without drawing from the grid. And as a result, you save money and you maximise the efficiency of the use of your renewable setup and you reduce your carbon footprint. If you don't have off-street parking, fear not, Olev have got grants available for local authorities to install residential on-street charge points. So I highly recommend that you speak to your council. Here's a prime example, an Ubitricity lamp post charge point. Many of those are being trialled in and about London. So at work we have a typical fast charger, an Evolt fast charger there. It's a pair of Type 2 sockets on a single post, that's part of the Charge Place Scotland network, which works either with an RFID card, which is about £20 a year, highly recommended, or with the free smartphone app. In terms of electricity tariffs, the vast majority of Charge Place Scotland is free to use. You can recharge two cars on once, as I said, on that particular unit, and it requires you to bring your own cable, just like my home charger. But when I'm out and about, and I'm away from work and I'm away from home, I'm absolutely spoilt for choice. This map is not only just for Charge Place Scotland, not for other networks, it's actually out of date. I took that screenshot about six months ago, and there's even more now. So fast chargers, just like the one at my work, are designed to allow you to charge up whilst you're at your destination. You rock up, you plug in, and you walk away. The vast majority of them in Scotland are on the Charge Place Scotland network. There are a couple of other providers, such as Polar or Podpoint as well requires an app. However, very few of those are in Scotland. Some of them may require you to pay a tariff to use as well. And actually, in addition to that, there are free charge points provided by many businesses, such as Silverburn Shopping Centre in Glasgow. No app, no card. Again, you just plug in, much like my home charger, and it's completely free to use. It's there to incentivise people to come to their shopping centre, and it works very well. 
Most of these charge points don't have a parking time limit, although it's good etiquette to move on as soon as your car's finished charging in case anyone else needs to use the charge point. Dundee, for example, has a three hour time limit and that seems to work really well. Rapid chargers, I've thinned down the map now to show you where you can get the fastest type of charge in Scotland, unless you have a Tesla, in which case there are superchargers that you can use. Anyway, these are designed basically to be a replacement for petrol stations. They will give you the quickest top up possible en route to your destination. Again, in Scotland, the vast majority are on the ChargePlace Scotland network and are free to use. At the moment, the maximum power that you'll get is 50 kilowatts, but there are higher power units coming very soon, up to 350 kilowatts in the near future, actually. These can top up a car in about 30 minutes. Other operators in Scotland include Ecotricity, which is about 30 pence a unit and requires an app. Instavolt, which is the most expensive at 35 pence per kilowatt hour, but it's contactless payment, so anyone's contactless credit card will work with that. Lidl have a selected number of stores which have a free to use rapid charger, so good on them. Similarly with Nissan, Nissan dealerships have rapid chargers at them for Nissan customers only, although potentially if you have a Chadmo equipped EV and you're in a bit of a stretch, they might be nice to you. The cables on rapid chargers are tethered to the charger. When you're dealing with such high currents, it's a big hefty bit of copper, so have fun trying to stick that in a car, but it makes sense to have them tethered. The petrol station analogy for rapid chargers means that you must stay with your car whilst the car is charging and then move on ASAP. Never abandon an electric car on a rapid charger because other people need to use it to get to their destination in a hurry. Now, this presentation was originally conducted at Dundee Museum of Transport and it would have been rude not to mention their glittering success story. Dundee is the undisputed electric vehicle capital of the UK. Just look at some of these figures here. 83 electric council vehicles, 61 electric taxis, three charging hubs, the latest one of which has just opened at Prince's Street. It has six triple-headed rapid chargers, three Type 2 posts, solar canopies, a grid storage battery, even the curb stones are made of recycled plastic. Now those figures look impressive, but they're actually out of date. This is them now. This was only a few weeks before the presentation. And yet, again, the, these figures, some of them have just been spiraling exponentially. They've just welcomed their 100th electric taxi to Dundee's fleet. Dundee now has about one in six of its taxis and private hire cars that are electric. Phenomenal, phenomenal effort. And there are certain people that should be congratulated on this. The EV champions of Dundee, Councillor Lynn Short is definitely one of the real champions who has spearheaded this and has worked against initial opposition to the idea, obviously, and managed to get the vast majority of the council on board in spectacular fashion. Rebecca Wallace from Drive Dundee Electric, which is Dundee City Council's electric vehicle campaign department, if you wish. Uh, Rebecca has done a stellar job in keeping things moving. Likewise, Fraser Crichton from the council as well. Basically, the three of them are the real champions. Mind you, that said, Gary McRae, who is the fleet manager. He was the one who took delivery of those initial four Mitsubishi iMeves back in the day. I think it was 2012 he took delivery of them and he's just continuously expanded that fleet since then. But outside of the council, there are others who are worthy of praise. Trudy Cunningham, the environment officer from the University of Dundee, who's now responsible for at least a dozen electric vehicles within the campus and also some of the best charging infrastructure and probably the most advanced charging infrastructure that you'll find in any university in terms of the number of charge points and number of locations that are owned by the university that have charge points in them, including rapid chargers. And of course, the late great David Young, who really kick-started the private revolution when it comes to electric vehicles in Dundee. He's the CEO of 203020 Taxis. And one day, his grandkids refused to get into his Ford Mustang. And they said to him, Grandpa, you're killing the planet. And that made him stop and think. His business had already been a pioneer because it was the first in the UK to use an electronic taxi tracking system rather than a cork pin board. So he thought maybe it's time to be a pioneer once again. He trialled a number of electric vehicles as taxis. The Leaf was the clear winner. And before you know it, a hundred electric taxis in Dundee and growing. Now, such has been Dundee's success that they've actually been advising authorities from far and wide. They recently welcomed Welsh civil servants who were thoroughly impressed by how Dundee has gone about its electric vehicle revolution. And of course there was the EV winter parade in 2017. As you can see from the top photo, incredibly well attended, such a diverse range of electric vehicles as well. But despite the fact that the parade was substantially sized, we actually passed more electric vehicles that weren't taking part. Dundee, EVs are just the norm in Dundee now, it's absolutely phenomenal. 
That Peugeot 106 electric is not mine, it belongs to the person who retrofitted mine and also has retrofitted his, an exceptionally talented electronic and mechanical engineer called Evan Tuer. And that Christmas tree, by the way, is fully lit, so it's no surprise that he won the prize for most festively decorated vehicle. Some of you may recognise the all-terrain EV of Chris Ramsey of Plug-in Adventures, which duly made its appearance not only at the EV Winter Parade, but I'm proud to say, and absolutely chuffed to bits to say, made its appearance at the talk at Dundee Museum of Transport. Thank you so much, Chris and Julie, for coming along. Now on to the myth-busting. I can't afford an EV. This is a common misconception. EVs are getting cheaper. So let's have a look at the price differences. The Mark I Leafa Centre launched well, if we take it from 2016, I should say, and the Mark II Leafa Centre from this year. So you've got 30 kilowatts more motor power, you've got a third bigger battery, you've got 40 miles more range at least, but the car's about a grand cheaper. In fact, more than a grand cheaper, a grand and a half. The original Leaf from Japan was slightly more expensive and had a smaller battery. So what are the main drivers of this cost reduction? First of all, increased demand, and of course, it's economies of scale, but also cheaper, better batteries. Battery prices are tumbling. Now let's have another look again at my two electromobiles and break down the cost of their batteries. So let's have a look at the LFP upgrade from 2012. The pack capacity was 18 kilowatt hours, and the pack price, without taking into account the work to actually fit it to the vehicle and retrofit the systems so that it could deal with lithium ion rather than NICAD, that came in just under six grand and as a result, that works out about £330 per kilowatt hour. As for the Nissan Leaf from 2014, the pack capacity was 24 kilowatt hours, but the pack price was just shy of £5,000. Therefore, that works out at just over £200 per kilowatt hour, a significant reduction of about a third within the space of a couple of years. But it doesn't stop there. By 2016, prices were under £200 per kilowatt hour. The Chevy Bolt there, which can do a genuine 230 miles per charge and has been released just about anywhere apart from the UK, so thanks for that Chevy. And by the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, we started to see the Renault Zoe 40 and of course the new Nissan Leaf coming in at about £150 per kilowatt hour. Now the exciting thing is that the industry target is about $100 per kilowatt hour to €100 Euros per kilowatt hour. And rumour has it that both Audi and Tesla have secured that sort of pricing already for vehicles that are coming out very soon, the Model 3 and uh, an electric creation from Audi. So we are fast approaching the point when EVs are going to be seriously cheaper to buy. But what if you don't have that sort of cash up front? Don't despair, there are other purchase options available, just like with any vehicle. So first of all, the PCP, the Personal Contract Purchase. Now this is the purchase choice for 82% of all new cars in the UK regardless of propulsion system. That includes petrol and diesel. So what you do is you pay your deposit, you lease the car, monthly leases, and then you can either hand it back or you can pay a final balloon payment. And all manufacturers will offer that. It's the most popular form of payment. There's also higher purchase, similar to PCP, pay monthly, then own car at the end. So there's no balloon price and it's a bit more expensive per month, but most EV manufacturers will offer that. However, don't forget, if you were just going to hand it back anyway, why not just lease it? There are EV leasing specialists, not leased drive electric, who have some seriously cheap deals. For example, their flagship one is the Kia Soul EV, a very underestimated electric vehicle, very competent, very decent range on it, excellent performance, I find it drives really well. That's available from £199 per month. And of course, if you're lucky enough to live in Scotland, the Energy Saving Trust Scotland six-year 0% interest-free loan of up to £35,000 for a new electric vehicle. So let's have a look at the maths on that, actually, for this loan. If we look at the RRP of a new Nissan Leaf Asenta, you're about £24,000. The monthly payments over six years are about £337. And if we look at market trajectory today, I estimate that it will be worth about £10,000 after six years. And as a result... If you were to sell the car immediately after six years and then retrospectively work out what you've effectively been paying per month, it works out at about £198 per month with no deposit and that's actually slightly cheaper than leasing. So it depends on whether you've got the cash up front and whether you can be financially savvy in that sense. However, regardless of what route you take, bear in mind that 1,000 petrol or diesel miles a month at 50 miles per gallon today works out at about £110. How many miles do you drive? How much petrol and diesel are you burning through? 
And then on top of that, especially if you're doing PCP or leasing, how much does your car cost per month? Chances are you'd be better off with the EV. So is your EV going to depreciate like a stone? Well, actually, you might be surprised. EV residual values are increasing. Now, this is the most controversially titled slide I have, but bear with me. There's some really interesting figures on this. The price of new EVs is decreasing, but the price of secondhand EVs is actually increasing. And that's because they are the most undervalued type of car on the market, especially the Nissan Leaf. So values of EVs, particularly the Leaf, reached a record low in early 2016 for secondhand values, but then they started to climb. So if we look at my Leaf, a 24 kilowatt hour Ascenta, that in May 2016 would have cost six and a half thousand pounds. In May 2017, I was annoyed because I had to pay eight thousand pounds for one. But by May 2018, I was very happy because I could sell it for a profit, an easy 10 grand. This is a clear indication of the increasing demand for electric vehicles, which is driving up those prices. Now, the big caveat here is those price rises will not last forever, but some people who bought at the right time got very lucky. So these price increases, are they pricing people with low budgets out of the market? Actually, no, not if you run the numbers. There's still good news there. What if you're on a shoestring budget? So the cheapest electric car on the market is going to be a second-hand Mitsubishi iNeve. It's typically the cheapest modern EV, and it's around about £6,000. It'll do motorway speeds, it can rapid charge. There are people who've driven them across the country on numerous occasions, not least Jonathan Porterfield of EcoCars when he's been moving his stock around. However, these are second-hand, so they're not eligible for an Energy Saving Trust Scotland loan. However, again, other finance options exist. Now, remember I mentioned EcoCars there? If you've not heard of them before, Jonathan Porterfield, based up in Orkney, he is single-handedly responsible for 90% of the electric vehicles on Orkney, but he also sells throughout the UK. He sources EVs to order. He is a goldmine of information. He makes sure that all of his potential customers get the exact information they need, the exact vehicle that they need. He will deliver it to them. He is held in very high regard. Anyway, he has started offering loans for these vehicles through Car Loan Warehouse, through a third party. So if you were to take out the five-year loan for £6,000, that works out at £121 a month. Now, is that a good value for money? Let's run the numbers. And in order to do that, I'm going to pitch the iMeve against its toughest competition, the cheapest car on AutoTrader. The cheapest one that was listed as working and not spares or repair when I did this slide was a Ford Fiesta. Now, when I did this slide, it was the beast from the east that had hit us, so that's why there's a bit of snow on the bonnet. But anyway, so it's showing as £195. Absolute bargain, but actually I'm going to do even better here. I'm giving it away. There you go, a free car versus the Mitsubishi iMeve. Let's run the numbers. 40 miles per gallon at £1.20 a litre, and bearing in mind you're going to be paying £150 tax a year, annual maintenance costs for a Fiesta are easily going to be about 500 quid when they're that age. Trust me, as someone who's owned enough old ICEs to learn the hard way, they are expensive to keep on the road. Because it's the cheapest car on AutoTrader, it's going to be a false economy buying it already, really. But there are no loan repayments, so that's all of your money. The iMeve, let's assume that we're charging from home at 15 pence a unit and doing 4 miles per kilowatt hour. I've assumed a generous £120 to keep the iMeve on the road every year. But really not much is going to break on that car. The loan price, £121. When you run those numbers, the iMeve costs £168 per month to run. Although it's actually 130 if you can charge for free, for example, on the Charge Place Scotland network. However, if you're doing 1,000 miles a month, the Fiesta is actually £190 a month, of which £136 is fuel alone. So if you can charge your EV for free, you're actually cheaper than the fuel that you require for the Fiesta. So the iMeve is cheaper than a free petrol car. If you can't afford the iMeve, you can't afford a car. EVs are affordable to all motorists. But what if your petrol or diesel car has much better fuel economy than that? Well, you might be surprised. The EV still works out cheaper. Now, I can personally vouch for this because I have the toughest competition for it, my Mark I Honda Insight. That car does 70 miles per gallon without even trying, despite being 17 years old. The fuel cost, again, £1.20 a litre. Tax is free and also annual maintenance costs for a Honda Golden service, and to keep the thing in good nick, about £300. 
by doing 1,000 miles a month, 12,000 miles a year, it would cost me about 1,200 quid to run the Insight. In contrast, the Leaf costs me 450. So I'm saving just shy of 800 pounds a year versus one of the most efficient ICEs on the road. You will be hard pressed to beat those figures that the Insight can do. So chances are you'll be saving even more. And in fact, to put that into perspective, let's compare it to a typical family saloon. Skoda Octavia diesel, 50 miles per gallon, tax is 160 pounds a year, annual maintenance costs again about 300 for decent servicing and so on. You are now saving 1,300 pounds a year versus a typical diesel saloon. For the domestic customer, that's appealing. But what about taxi drivers? Let's up the mileage. By doing 35,000 miles a year, which is fairly conservative for some taxi drivers, you're costing about £4,200 a year to run the Octavia, but only £1,300 to run the Leaf. So you're saving almost £3,000 a year by electrifying your taxi. But let's make things harder for the EV. Now, we're only going to be charging the EV using Instavolt, the most expensive charging network, certainly in Scotland. So that's 35 pence a unit. We're going to be continuously rapid charging that leaf. And even still, we're saving 1,200 quid a year versus a typical diesel saloon. And that, bear in mind, is making things as hard as possible for the EV. Now, the reality of the situation, especially in Dundee, is that the Charge Play Scotland network is free for now. And as a result, you are saving that 4,282 pounds a year. But this is where it gets interesting. The monthly energy saving trust loan repayment, which is available to taxis as well, as far as I'm aware, is £337. But the monthly costs for the Skoda Octavia diesel are £356. So actually, the LEAF is paying for itself. No wonder over a hundred and counting of Dundee's taxis are electric. Another common misconception regards battery life. You need to replace the battery after five years. You absolutely do not. EV batteries last far longer than you might think. And a prime example of this is Wizzy, the Nissan Leaf taxi from Cornwall. So by the time Wizzy had racked up 100,000 miles, it still had all 12 of its state of health bars, which indicate its capacity now versus the capacity when it was new. As a result, you can tell the battery is in excellent health. Wizzy was retired as a taxi after 174,000 miles by which point it had lost a couple of capacity bars. But nonetheless, the only repairs it needed, the only repair, actually, mechanical repair it required in all that time, was one ball bearing. Name me one internal combustion engine vehicle that can legitimately claim that level of reliability. And in fact, I've just recently learned that Wizzy is still in regular use with its new owner, again, still on the original battery pack. So why are EVs so reliable? EVs are the most reliable vehicles on the road, and the reasons why include far less moving components, so therefore there's less to break. An electric motor only has one moving component, whereas an internal combustion engine has hundreds, and as a result, the likelihood of an internal combustion engine breaking is substantially higher than an electric motor. In fact, typically a petrol car will manage 100,000 miles before it starts to go seriously wrong, a diesel 150,000 miles. Mechanically, electric vehicles could be on for a million miles on the motor, before they suffer any major issues. Also bear in mind that an electric vehicle doesn't need a clutch, a gearbox, an exhaust gas regulator, a timing belt. There are so many more components that are removed from the vehicle. Therefore, there is far less to break. There's also far less heat and vibration. Electric motors are very smooth and very efficient and therefore very little energy is wasted as heat. Compare that to an internal combustion engine, which is rattly, it's inefficient, it's going to shake itself to bits, and there's a lot of energy wasted as heat. So why do EV batteries last longer than phone or laptop batteries? This is another misconception, because, of course, everyone thinks that a mobile phone or laptop battery only lasts two or three years, therefore an EV battery must only last two or three years. No, this is why. There is better battery management, so the control electronics, the battery management system, that look after the individual cells within the battery pack are far superior within an EV than they are within consumer electronics. There's also active thermal management, in other words, a heating or a cooling system which keeps the batteries at their optimal temperature. There's also a different operating environment. So EVs typically operate between minus 10 and 30 degrees C in the UK, which suits batteries quite well. Most lithium ion batteries typically like to run about 25 degrees C they don't mind a bit higher, they don't mind a bit lower. Whereas phones 
live in your pocket, so you're looking at about 37 degrees C most of the time. But if you're running a particularly intensive app, that could go up to about 50 degrees C. The battery, of course, is quite close to the CPU. There's no cooling, and as a result, the battery will degrade quicker. But laptops are probably the worst. So the CPU in a laptop can get up to 90 degrees C. So therefore, the battery pack is exposed to very hot temperatures in a confined space and a temperature gradient. And allow me to explain why. Here's a typical lithium-ion battery pack from a few years ago. Many of them are much smaller pouch cells integrated into a laptop now, but in the days of removable battery packs, you would have two rows of 18650s. That's what you've got in a Tesla Model S, the 18650 cell. Now, the arrow shows you this way to the laptop, in other words, pointed towards the bottom of the screen. Therefore, the row at the bottom of the screen is closer to the CPU, and it therefore gets hotter, and those cells degrade quicker. And quite often, if you open up old laptop battery packs that are seemingly dead and only giving you about 10 minutes worth of charge, if you look at the row that was closest to the CPU and check the cell's capacities, they are dead. If you check the row of cells that's furthest away from the CPU and at the surface of the laptop, the edge of the laptop, you will find that they are actually in really good condition. Some people will tell you it takes a lot of energy to produce batteries, but that conveniently skirts over a slight inconvenient truth. Petrol and diesel do not come from thin air. There was a brilliant article about the energy price of petrol. Here are the figures from the US. One gallon of gas requires six kilowatt hours of electricity to refine. One gallon in the US will typically get you about 24 miles, but six kilowatt hours worth of electricity will get you 20 miles. Bear in mind, as I said, those are US figures. The figures in the UK are slightly better. It's 50 miles per gallon and 24 miles for six kilowatt hours. But nonetheless, if we were to divert the electricity used to produce petrol and diesel into directly powering EVs, we would cover 50% of their range. And remember, we have refineries in this country, and as a result, we would actually be reducing the pressure on the grid because we are actually producing the petrol here. And therefore, we can directly power EVs with our existing capacity of grid. Also bear in mind the high efficiency of an electric drivetrain means that any extra embodied energy within a battery pack and any extra embodied carbon is paid off versus an internal combustion engine comfortably within three years. In fact, probably a lot sooner these days. And that's without even taking into account the embodied energy of petrol and diesel, by the way. Now, what about the materials? This is something that's been making the news quite a lot recently. Are we going to run out? What are we doing about recycling? It's a question that keeps coming up, and it's one that I'm going to answer for you now. First of all, let's understand what's in a lithium-ion battery. So, within an electric vehicle, of course, you have your battery pack. Inside that pack, there are a series of modules which contain the cells, which, of course, contain the chemical reactions that propel the vehicle. There are numerous types of cell. The cylindrical cell, like the 18650 used in the Tesla Model S and Model X. The prismatic cell, big chunky boxes used in the BMW i3. And pouch cells used by just about everyone else. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to go into the intricacies of how a lithium-ion battery works in this particular presentation, but we at least have a visual demonstration of what we need for our shopping list. So, the current collector, the basically the metal foil that collects the electrons from the reaction of one electrode and stuffs them out into the external circuit to power something. You need copper for the negative terminal in a lithium-ion battery. You then need graphite, some sort of carbon, for the active material, the active chemical, within the negative electrode. And then you've got lithium, obviously. You've got some sort of polymer, some sort of plasticky separator that stops the negative and positive electrodes from touching each other internally, which means that you would get an internal short circuit. You've got an electrolyte, some sort of organic liquid or gel of some description with a lithium-based salt. Looks a bit like table salt, wouldn't want to eat it. And then aluminium for the positive terminal. And of course, the key active ingredients on the positive terminal are a lithium metal oxide of some description. And the vast majority of them, apart from lithium iron phosphate, use cobalt. Lithium and cobalt are the ones that make all the headlines, so let's look at these in more detail. Now, first up, lithium. Is lithium recovered from recycled batteries today? Well, originally not really. There's actually surprisingly little lithium in a lithium ion battery, only about 7% by weight. The materials that recyclers were most interested in recovering from lithium ion cells originally were copper and cobalt because those were the most expensive metals. However, recyclers are starting to focus on recovering lithium from batteries. For example, Sungil Hitech, which is a South Korean company, is recovering lithium phosphate in its recycling process. So now we are starting to recycle lithium. 
Are we going to run out? No, there are vast lithium salt flats in countries like Bolivia. And there's also mineral extraction as well as brine extraction. Uh, however, lithium can also be extracted from seawater. The sea is basically one big diluted lithium brine. However, there's far more concentrated lithium-rich brines in Cornwall, down the old tin mines, which could be used to ensure continuity of supply of lithium for the UK's burgeoning battery industry. And as with any mineral, production is ramping up with demand. Will we be priced out by increasing demand? Absolutely not. If lithium prices quadrupled overnight, the cost of battery packs would only increase by about 1.6%, and that cost would likely be absorbed by the manufacturer. And of course, if lithium prices did quadruple, then the old-fashioned recycling techniques that weren't very good at recovering lithium, lithium recovered from those would actually become economically competitive. And as I say, we are continuously improving the recycling processes for lithium-ion batteries. So actually, again, we are recovering those materials. That would give even more incentive to recover lithium. Now for cobalt. Everyone automatically thinks of Democratic Republic of Congo when it comes to the source of cobalt. But this is a photo of a Canadian mining town called Cobalt. Can you guess what they mine there? Is cobalt recovered from batteries today? Yes, as I said before, it's why lithium-ion batteries were recycled in the first place and the value of cobalt is ensuring that today. It's estimated that 25,000 tonnes of cobalt will be recycled annually from dead batteries by 2025. Are we going to run out? No. OK, 50% of cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. There are human rights issues there. There is an ongoing effort to resolve these. However, cobalt comes from other countries too. There are mining companies ramping up supply around the globe, not least in Canada. Are we going to be priced out by increasing demand? No. If cobalt prices quadrupled, the cost of battery packs would increase by 10%. However, new cell chemistries are gradually being introduced, which are reducing the amount of cobalt in batteries. So, for example, one of the most common electric vehicle battery types is lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide, or NMC. And that initially had one nickel atom per one manganese atom per one cobalt atom. So it was a ratio of one to one to one. And now we're up to NMC 622, so 6 nickel, 2 manganese, 2 cobalt, and we'll soon find 811 on the market. And that makes them even cheaper to make. And here's a quick graph that shows you just how much cobalt is being removed from cells. Now, lithium cobalt oxide with no manganese or nickel to pad things out is still used in smartphones today, and that has 40% of its constituent material being cobalt. So not very environmentally or ethically friendly. The BMW i3, though, only has about a third of that amount of cobalt because it has NMC111. However, upcoming EVs will have NMC622, which half that down to 7%, and of course 811 is going to take it down to 4%, so we're really starting to remove that level of cobalt. And LFP, as I mentioned before, doesn't have any cobalt at all. That's regularly used in electric buses, for example. So there's lots more cobalt in smartphone batteries than in EVs. Just imagine how many EVs we could supply cobalt for by making better use of recycling smartphone batteries, and that is happening today. And another final thing I want to show you is just how little lithium there is in a lithium-ion battery. Look at that, about 7% tops. Now, this is a tired old misconception, and it's one that certainly no longer holds water in Scotland. EVs are coal-fired cars. However, they actually have the cleanest drivetrains of any non-human powered vehicle. So first up, Scotland has one of the cleanest electricity grids in the world. We generated 68.1% of our electricity demand from renewables in 2017, and we had 10 gigawatts of installed renewables capacity. Bearing in mind we have a 5 gigawatt peak demand, that's a fair amount of capacity. Chances of all the wind turbines and solar panels going full pelt at the same time, of course, is slim, but nonetheless, it's a lot of capacity and it continues to grow. The rest of the electricity in Scotland is provided by nuclear power and gas, Scotland shut its last coal-fired power plant, Longanet, in 2016. Also, Scotland is a net exporter of electricity, so we're rarely impacted by the dirtier carbon intensity of grids south of the border. Now, looking at the above, and if we assume the International Panel of Climate Change figures of 490 grams of CO2 for gas per kilowatt hour, and if we assume ratios as shown there for renewables, gas and nuclear, your average CO2 emissions from electricity in Scotland are less than 61 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, which is typically one of the top 10 cleanest grids in the world. 
Now, if we assume four miles per kilowatt hour for a typical EV, that equates to 15.25 grams of CO2 per mile. The average CO2 emissions for a new petrol or diesel car in the UK in 2017 was 121 grams of CO2 per kilometre. So converting that into miles, that's 193.6 grams of CO2 per mile without taking into account energy and CO2 required to make petrol or diesel in the first place. So EVs are by far the cleanest vehicles in Scotland apart from bikes. But you know what? What if EVs were coal-fired? Actually, the situation wouldn't be quite as bad as you might think. Quite often, people will try to say that EVs are less environmentally friendly when coal-fired than an internal combustion engine vehicle, but often this is a fallacy. They will compare the three-ton behemoth, which is the Tesla Model X, to an itsy-bitsy, teeny-weeny, city runabout machine. And of course, the weight disadvantage just makes that such a bogus comparison. So let's compare apples with apples. Conveniently, a number of manufacturers are now producing electrified versions of their internal combustion engine vehicles. So let's compare the Golf GTD Blue Line, hashtag Dieselgate, with a coal-fired e-Golf. So the fuel economy of the diesel Golf is 62.8 miles per gallon. And if we consider the CO2 figures 189 grams of CO2 per mile, whereas the coal-fired e-Golf doing four miles per kilowatt hour on coal, which is 820 grams per kilowatt hour, is actually 205 grams of CO2 per mile. This is starting to look bad for the EV, but that's tank to wheel emissions for the diesel and source to wheel for the electric. So let's compare apples with apples. The number of kilowatt hours required to make one gallon of diesel is six, as we've already discussed. The embodied CO2 of the electricity that was used to produce the diesel, which of course is going to come from the same coal-fired grid that was used to power the e-golf because we're comparing apples with apples is close to five kilos the embodied co2 per mile is therefore 78 grams and the source to wheel co2 per mile for the diesel is 267 grams per mile versus 205 for the e-golf let's look at the real world figures here and in scotland even if we refined the diesel using our very clean electricity, we're still 194.8 grams of CO2 per mile for the diesel Golf, but only 15.25 for the e-Golf. So EVs are cleaner than internal combustion engine vehicles, even if they're coal powered. Plus, bear in mind, it's a lot easier to fit scrubbers to one big coal-fired power plant than it is to hundreds of thousands of internal combustion engines. Another misconception is that the grid is simply not going to cope with the massive uptake of EVs. Fear not. EVs are part of the solution to grid stability. Electric vehicles can help to balance the grid. Firstly, an electrician wouldn't install a charge point at your house without ensuring there's ample electricity supply. And that's not just for the consumer unit in your house, but the actual full street as a whole. So if needs be, the consumer unit, the master fuse or whatever will be upgraded if necessary. And also, another way of looking at it is if you were to get a smart charger, such as the Zappi that I mentioned before, that will throttle back the charging of the vehicle if the house's electricity demand is too high. However, the house I'm in has a very humble 60 amp master fuse, and I can still charge my car, use my oven, boil the kettle, and have the microwave on at the same time without any issues. But why would I do all those at the same time? At night, demand is low but renewable energy from wind is high, and therefore I set my car to start charging in the middle of the night, about two o'clock in the morning, whilst I'm asleep, and it's fully charged by the time I wake up. Additionally, if you switch to an Economy 7 tariff, you'll get even cheaper overnight charging. And furthermore, if you were to switch to a dynamic tariff, such as Agile Octopus, which has just been released by Octopus Energy, you could potentially be paid to charge your EV overnight. Agile Octopus tracks wholesale energy prices, and changes your tariff cost every couple of hours and alerts you by smartphone. And it makes a significant difference if you were to be able to use cheaper electricity when it's available. Utilization of renewable energy is also maximized by charging overnight because grid demand at peak times is minimized and therefore you need less peaking plants like gas and so on to make up the difference. The national grid actually supports an earlier switch to EVs than the UK government. That is how beneficial they are. And of course, coming soon, vehicle to the grid. Let's quickly cover this one. What is it? It's the ability to power your house using your electric car. So you come home, 
having used half the battery in your car, you plug it in and then you use that to cook your dinner, to watch the TV and so on. And then overnight, the house charges the car back off of off peak electricity. Why would you do it? Because of that peak you see in the evening. If you have a look at the graph on the right of typical UK electricity demand, you'll see around about six o'clock, the electricity demand spikes because everyone's come home and they've put their tea on. Again, smart and dynamic tariffs such as Agile Octopus will help to safeguard against peak time prices. They'll help to maximize the benefit of vehicle to grid. The smart system, which is allowing you to charge your car super cheaply overnight or at low demand for the grid, and then feed back into the house and power the house during peak prices. So you're safeguarding yourself against peak time prices. You will get cheaper bills as long as your car is plugged in and basically a big storage battery for the house on wheels. It's the equivalent of Economy 7 24 seven, and it maximizes the use of renewable energy. Is it gonna degrade your battery because you're using it more? No, actually some of my old colleagues at WMG recently published a paper about this. They did a comprehensive study with cells being subjected to various different environments that were simulated, such as Anchorage in Alaska, freezing cold in Cairo in Egypt, absolutely boiling hot, doing typical electric vehicle drive cycles and vehicle to grid. And they found that actually the EV battery lifespan was improved by vehicle to grid by about 10%. Apparently, EV batteries enjoy a good workout. So fuel cells are better, say some. And I say batteries are technologically and economically superior to fuel cells. There's only one graph that you need to see. Here you go. 100 kilowatt hours of renewable electricity we start with. We can either transmit it through the grid and lose about 10% of it through transmission losses, then stuff it into a battery, lose another 15%, and then put it through an electric vehicle, which is 90% efficient. And as a result, you get about 70 kilowatt hours back. You can actually improve that figure if the solar power comes directly from your roof and goes straight into the car. So no grid losses. However, if you were to do the same with hydrogen and you were to run it through electrolysis to produce hydrogen and then compress it, transport it, stick it through a fuel cell, which is only 50% efficient, gives off a lot of waste heat, and then put it through the fuel cell vehicle as a whole, you can get as little as 19 kilowatt hours back. So EVs are over three times as efficient as fuel cell vehicles. Less energy and cheaper running costs. And also, it's worth pointing out that EVs can do vehicle to grid, as I mentioned earlier, so they're part of the solution to grid balancing. EVs can be charged from home or whilst parked, so therefore it's cheaper and more efficient than going out of your way to refuel. I don't care how long my EV takes to recharge, as long as it's ready when I am. EVs are safer to refuel as well. Bit of a cheap shot, but it's worth pointing out. And of course, batteries can respond to loads faster than fuel cells. And in fact, fuel cell vehicles need batteries in order to respond to sharp throttle demand. Some people might say electric vehicles are not big enough for their needs, but they would be gravely mistaken because there are some pretty big electric vehicles out there on the market today. Let's start with the big. These electric vans from Iveco and LDV will soon be joined by the Renault Masters ED as well. Up to 4.1 meter wheelbase, multiple configurations available. Look at that. If you work for a local authority or a business and you have particular requirements for your vans, chances are there's one that exists already that suits you. They can do 120 miles on a charge potentially and they're rapid charge capable. You can get bigger than that though. These, this is not even an exhaustive list of some of the bigger lorries that are available now, but the Fuso e is one of the newest ones on the market up to 14 tonnes gross weight, eight tonne payload, pure EV or range extended. The Teva Motors is available with a range extender on board, up to a 100 mile range, perfect for deliveries and rapid charge capable. And of course, coming soon is the Tesla Semi articulated lorry, which can allegedly do 500 miles per charge. But bigger still, what if you have about 99 people that you need to transfer in a hurry? The electric bus market is booming, particularly in China, but the UK actually has three builders of electric buses, Alexander Dennis in Falkirk, and then Optair and Wright Bus. These can carry up to 99 passengers with a 145 mile range. And of course, once again, they are rapid charge capable. And it's worth pointing out that they're available from tiny single deck minibuses all the way up to double deck machines like the one in the photo there. Now, if that's still not big enough for you, you are clearly taking the mick, but I shall humour you. Introducing the world's biggest land-based battery electric vehicle. This is a 45 tonne dump truck of which 
A tenth of that weight is a 700 kilowatt hour battery pack. It saves up to 100,000 litres of diesel per year and 262 tonnes of CO2. It has a loading capacity of 65 tonnes, which it uses to carry rocks and minerals down from a mountainside. Now, engineers amongst you may have suddenly thought it goes up empty, it comes back down full, regenerative braking is a thing, and yes, you would be right, it uses 30 kilowatt hours on ascent and generates 40 kilowatt hours of electricity on descent. So therefore, it's actually not only the world's biggest battery electric vehicle, it's a power plant. If you're going to be awkward about it and fly to work, I've still got you, because all forms of transport are being electrified. First up, rail. Viva Rail are converting old London underground stock to run on batteries, and in fact there was a fully charged episode about that not too long ago. But on top of that, Network Rail actually converted an electric overhead electric train to battery power about six years ago, 2012 now. It was the Batteries Included project. The design for this was only meant to last about 15 miles on battery power before rejoining an electrified route. But actually they smashed their expectations with six year old battery tech, 2012's battery tech, which was obviously nowhere near as good as it is now. 50, 50 miles per charge at speeds of up to 100 miles an hour. And it's a great shame that the company that they were borrowing the train from said, we want it back in its original trim. So therefore we had this fantastic world leading piece of tech and we've lost it. We need it back. By sea, well, Norway has just ordered 53 electric ferries following the success of its first one. There's an absolutely gorgeous design of electric ferry that you can catch Fjords tours on now. And of course, air travel, EasyJet, plans to be flying electric short haul flights within the space of a decade. And Norway, again, leading the way, are saying they want to ban anything that's not electric for short haul flights by 2040. Now, some people will say, I'm going to dip my toes in the water and get a PHEV, a plug-in hybrid. And then the next car after that will likely be an EV. But why not go fully electric today? And just to show you why, let's do a running cost challenge. Let's go from Dundee up the A9, the new electric A9 that's being developed, to Inverness. It's a journey of about 140 miles. So we've got four contenders in this race. We have a conventional hybrid like a Prius. We have a plug-in hybrid fully charged prior to the departure, a range extended BMW i3, and a long range pure EV such as a Mark II Leaf, Ionic, Tesla, or Zoe. Which car is gonna be the most expensive to run? Which one's gonna use the most fuel? You might be surprised. It's actually the plug-in hybrid by some margin. It is the most expensive car to run, and this is why. Most PHEVs can't rapid charge, Therefore, if they were to stop at a service station, they wouldn't be charged. And as a result, the fuel economy would be even worse on the subsequent leg. But also, the petrol engine that's in a plug-in hybrid is not a refined unit at all. If anything, conventional hybrids seem to have better fuel economy due to better, more refined internal combustion engines. On top of that, plug-in hybrids electric motors are lugging around a big, heavy petrol engine and fuel tank when the battery is being used. But then when the battery is depleted, the petrol engine is lugging around a big heavy battery pack, which is empty and dead weight. So therefore an EV is by far the most efficient setup because it's tuned purely to electric driving and a conventional hybrid just manages to get better fuel economy. PHEVs are often bought for long distances, but you will find that their fuel economy is a backward step versus a conventional hybrid. So what if you drive shorter journeys than the above example? What if you're shouting at me through the screen saying, well, I always charge up my plug-in hybrid and I hardly ever use the petrol engine. Well, just go and get a pure EV then. Burn no fuel. Get better fuel economy in terms of watt hours per mile or miles per kilowatt hour. You will genuinely benefit from it by going purely electric because you will be able to go further without using fuel. And what if you regularly drive longer journeys than the above example? Well, Modern EVs are more than capable. They've got big long ranges on them. It's pretty much a given that by 2020, any new EV is going to have at least a 200 mile range at this rate. And there are some examples coming out on the market very shortly with a 300 mile range, which are just about within the affordability of many people's wallets. Also, modern EVs can rapid charge in the space of about 20 to 30 minutes. So cross country treks are no problem. But just to really hammer it home, Jonathan Porterfield of EcoCars has driven Nissan Leafs and Mitsubishi iMeves the length and breadth of the British Isles. It's more than doable. You might just need to stop a little bit more for a shorter range vehicle. What if your longer journeys are infrequent? Well, own an EV. You'll save so much money during the year 
that when you occasionally have to take the train or hire a hybrid or indeed a Tesla from white car if and when necessary, that sort of money is going to be a drop in the ocean versus what you've saved versus running a PHEV, a hybrid or an internal combustion engine vehicle. Pure EV is the way to go and manufacturers know it. The above is just a small selection of quotes from big auto CEOs who've realised this is the future and they are going all in. But perhaps my favourite one is from the notoriously anti-plug-in Toyota who are at it once again with their self-charging hybrid nonsense. Here's an advert from May 2017 where they've depicted a charge point covered in cobwebs and said no plugging in. But a mere seven months later they have claimed that they're going to go electric by 2025 in their attempts to cut CO2 emissions. They have invested heavily in battery research. So by now you're sold, that's fantastic. Here are a few tips for EV purchasing. When buying an EV, you want to check the battery state of health. This is particularly easy in the Nissan LEAF. Look for the state of health bars on the right hand side of the charge meter and that tells you the capacity of the pack versus when it was new. Also make sure you get both cables, there are two cables. There's your Type 2 public charging cable and your 3-pin emergency cable. The Type 2 cable is for public charging and also for home charging if you have a socketed charge point. That will be able to do up to 7 kilowatts charging or 22 kilowatts if you have a three-phase onboard charger like the Renault Zoe. The 3-pin unit is for emergency charging, it means you can plug in anywhere. It's also known as the granny cable because it's used when you go around to your granny's house, your granny doesn't have an EV, she doesn't have a charge point, but you can plug it in where she would normally put the lawnmower or indeed sling it through a window. And if you're around at a friend's or a relative's without a home charge point, that is an absolute godsend. It supports a much lower 2.3 kilowatts, but it's better than nothing and trust me, you're going to want it. What if you're a fleet operator or a business owner? Well, a couple of top tips for you. Root Monkey are specialists in fleet optimization. They will take data about the vehicles you have, the routes that you do, and they will optimize that for you. They'll say you'd be better rerouting this route so you're doing however many miles in this particular vehicle. This particular vehicle could then become electric and you could be saving so many hundreds or thousands of pounds a year. They've got all the data you could possibly want out of your information. And also Energy Saving Trust and Fully Charged, of course, with Robert Llewellyn and Johnny Smith, have teamed up to give a special video guide with EV advice for and from businesses. It's also worth pointing out that the Energy Saving Trust has loads of information for prospective EV owners, both business and domestic, so it's worth checking out their website. Let's have a quick look at the business benefits for EVs. There are loads. There's low company car tax and employer national insurance contributions. There's no road tax. There's 100% first year allowance, so you can offset the whole purchase cost against taxable profits in the first year. There's the OLEV grant of up to 35% or £4,500 off of electric cars. That's slightly higher in terms of absolute cash value, £8,000 off of electric vans. If you're lucky enough to live in Scotland, you can have the business six year 0% interest loan of up to £100,000, of which £35,000 is per car or van, £10,000 per motorcycle or scooter, £50,000 per electric heavy goods vehicle, cycle facilities are eligible, as is video and teleconferencing facilities. That's quite clever actually, so you don't even need to travel in the first place. Funding is available nationally for workplace charge points. Similarly, Department for Transport Electric Taxi Grant is also available for vehicles that meet the Transport for London conditions for fitness for motor taxis as long as they have a greater than 70 mile EV range. And benefit in kind, now this is currently the same for EVs and PHEVs at 13% but that is going to change very shortly and as of 2020 only purely electric vehicles will qualify for the super low 2% benefit in kind rate. And also of course there are substantial savings in fuel and maintenance. So when buying an EV check out the Energy Saving Trust website. As I said, check out which loans, grants and incentives are available for you. Shop around, get the best home charger quote. If you live in Scotland, I would highly recommend BMM, APT, which do Evolt basically, and Joro. Uh, they, are, they all come with really good customer feedback. Again, look out for a quote for a Zappi home charger. Even if you don't have solar panels, it's still a very clever charge point and it's made in the UK and they've got a six week waiting list because they're so popular and because it's that clever and it's the same price as an equivalent dumb charger. It's an amazing piece of kit so zappy all the way. Sign up to Charge Play Scotland. The app is free 
but the RFID card at £20 a year is likely going to get you out of a tight spot on more than one occasion, so I'd strongly recommend it. There's loads of friendly help and advice from EVA Scotland, Electric Vehicle Association of Scotland. There's their website there. They're also on Facebook, as are the Scottish EV Drivers Club. And of course, be sure to check out EV news and reviews from Fully Charged. And remember the EV specialist Eco Cars for pre-owned electric vehicles, Jonathan Porterfield, of course, and Drive Electric for leasing cheaper than the PCP on the vast majority of new EVs. And I'm always happy to help. I am at 106 Ewan on the Twitters, and I'm more than happy to help you out with any EV queries that you may have. For a more technical explanation on battery tech, check out Under the Bonnet EV Battery Misconceptions, which is a webinar I did for Energy Saving Trust Scotland a couple of months ago. And of course, now on YouTube, we have my own channel, which you're watching now, Plug Life Television, which has just launched. So this is where I left everyone at the end of the presentation with my 106 Electromobile at the top of Dundee Law, which is the big hill which dominates Dundee. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, there we go. I hope that was worth the wait. I would have had that online sooner, but immediately after the presentation, I had to nip down to Coventry for EVs in the Park. Now, for those of you who don't know, EVs in the Park is basically like a car boot sale, except that all the cars are electric and no one's selling anything. Everyone had great fun. There were all sorts of EVs there on the day, everything from the Renault Twizy all the way up to the Tesla Model X, which was duly doing its uh, dance with the lights and doors and so on. So a huge thanks to Craig from the Renault Zoe Owners Club and to all of the other organisers and supporters of the event for a job well done. See you again soon for another episode of Plug Life Television.